Coming up on Artifacts, the arts and the law with a top Minnesota attorney who's also a literary agent. Along with arts and medicine with a doctor and a musician who help artists that hurt. And the arts and the Oscars, a sneak peek at the rollicking fun fundraiser, Hollywood 12, including Oscar picks with Miss Richfield. And that's happening only in March on Artifacts. Stay tuned. Welcome to the March edition of Artifacts. I'm Phil Lindsay at the Minneapolis Community Development Agency. And I'm Janet Zahn with the Office of Film, Video, and Recording. And this is the show that brings the arts and artists in Minneapolis home to you. Starting with our first guests, Scott Meyer, the venerable organizer of the largest Oscar Night America Academy Awards party in the country. That's Hollywood 12. Along with the one and only Miss Richfield. She's picking the Oscar winners and losers, and she's got the absolute latest from Hollywood. So if you want to be in the know, this is your show. That's right. You know, I was going to Bloomington, and I missed Richfield. Oh. <laughs> Next, we're going to be talking about the health and well-being of artists with Dr. Janine Spear, who practices arts medicine at the Sister Kenny Institute, and Janet Horvath, who's the associate principal cellist with the Minnesota Orchestra. She's also a pioneer in the area of arts medicine. Then, Phil, welcome. Barbara Gislason, a top Minnesota attorney who works in the area of entertainment law and also as a literary agent. They'll cover some hot and sticky legal issues facing the entertainment industry today and you'll find out what it's like to be a, an agent in the literary world. Then, now hold on to your hats for gospel and R&B, Jamie Whitner. He's going to be singing on our uh, monthly performing segment. He's one of the performers participating in the spring concert series at the new Central City Theater. Good music, good conversation, some film clips, an art quote, some arts news, and a fabulous Artifacts giveaway. All coming your way on Artifacts, starting with The Scoop on Hollywood 12 with Scott Mayer and Miss Richfield. Right after this clip from A Simple Plan, a Minnesota-made movie that received two Academy Award nominations, including one for Billy Bob Thornton as Best Supporting Actor. God, I go, you know, I've, I've, never, I've never even kissed a girl before. You know, if, if, if being rich will change that, I'm, I'm all for it. I don't care. I just want to feel it, you know. I just want to, I just want to know what people do, you know. I don't care if it's because of the money. Hey, I'm going to be happy now, right? Sure you are. We all are. Yeah, that's right, we all are. And that was a clip, once again, from A Simple Plan, a Minnesota movie nominated for an Oscar. And we saw Billy Bob Thornton there. Um, with me here are Scott Mayer. Welcome, Scott. Janet. And Miss Richfield. Miss Richfield? Hello. Hi, fellas. <laughs> uh, Welcome, uh, Scott Janet. and yeah, Janet. This is Janet, yeah. No, and Scott. You've met Scott. Yes, I've Great. met Scott, and you're Miss Richfield. Nice to meet you. And we're here to talk about Hollywood 12 and the Oscars. It's the biggest Oscar party outside of L.A. It is, and sometimes it's even bigger than the actual event in L.A. Is it really? How many yes. people do you expect? Uh, we're hoping to have about 4,000 people attend this year's event. That's great, Miss Richfield. I want yes. to ask you, since we just saw the Billy Bob Thornton clip. What do you think, supporting actor? Is Billy going to pull it off? Well, um, <laughs> actually, I uh, have not seen that film. And uh, although I just recently saw an excellent made-for-TV about Sonny and Cher. Oh. I don't know if you saw that, but I'm really pulling for that. And uh, yeah. I'm a big Sonny and Cher fan. Which camera should I be looking at? Just look right, right there. there. There we are. OK. Yeah. Oh. Uh, anyway, and uh, we just did get the Titanic in Richfield uh, last week, so I'm really pulling for Kate Winslet. So, uh, okay. yeah. Okay, well, uh, Scott, let's go back to talking about the event a little bit. Tell me what's extra special and new this year. Well, what we're doing new this year is that we're going to be having a very VIP dinner before the actual event. This mm -hmm. is the very first year in, a, in the Oscar history that it's going to be on Sunday night. And so we assume that people are going to have a little more time this year to get ready for the, for the big event on mm -hmm. Sunday, March 21st. And so we're going to have a pre-dinner event at Linguini and Bob's in Butler Square in mm -hmm. downtown Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And after that, people can walk on over to the Orpheum Theater and Bravo. And we're going to
going to have some great live entertainment this year, some that has not been seen before. Mm. And uh, Kathy Rigby, the ex-gymnast, is going to be helping host the event, mm -hmm. along with, of course, Miss Richfield. Thank you. Uh, we also Looking forward to it. <laughs> We also have Frank Fasolero, who is the uh, yeah. news anchor on Carrie 11. And I think Miss Richfield, actually, do you know Frank? Frank and I used to date a number of years ago, so we're very, very close. And uh, actually, now you know he's broken up with that uh, gal from CCO. So, so we hear. You know, yeah. he's, he's available, ladies, so uh, come on. Come on to my house. And, and visit could, with Frank. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I was really pleased. I'm sh pleased for you that Frank was going to be doing it with you. I think it's going to be a really good time. Mm -hmm. But we also have Amy Daniels from The mm -hmm. Point who's going to be hosting. And I don't know if yes. she's going to provide a little competition from, for you uh, in, in the Frank category. I don't know. I don't think so. Because uh, Amy, she's uh, kind of earthy. Kind of a natural gal. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> nice. Good yeah. for radio. Right. Good for radio. <laughs> and also, Dudley Riggs is going to be helping oh, host the event. Dudley. And he's always fun. And mm -hmm. so we've got a full slate of, of presenters. Mm -hmm. in, but we also have as entertainment uh, the cast of Forever Plaid that's appearing at the Chanhassen Dinner Theater. Mm -hmm. We've got musicians, singers. The Twin Cities Gay Men's Chorus are going to do a tribute to movies at the beginning of fun. the event. So we've got a lot of stuff going on at the Orpheum Theater and also at the Bravo Event Center next door. I want to be clear on the date. It is the Oscar night. Yes. yes. That is March 21st. That's Sunday. correct. It's all happening then. That's right. Now, the Oscars, I want to, Miss Richfield, I'm just really going to count on you to do the Oscar picks here for us. And okay. Us, okay? All right. So I'm we kind of went through Best Supporting Actor, but I want to talk Supporting I love China. Well, yes, thanks. Mm. Supporting Actress. Um, no, thank you. Kathy Bates in Primary Colors, Brenda <coughs> Blethen in Little Voice. Judy Dench, Shakespeare in Love, Rachel Griffiths, Hillary and Jackie, or Lynn Redgrave, Gods and Monsters. What's your pick, Miss Richfield? I have not seen any of those films, <laughs> but um, I've always been a big fan of Judith. I think she's so mm -hmm. pretty, mm -hmm. and I love her accent. So I think Judith, Judith might pull it out this time. Mm -hmm. That's going to be my vote. What do you think? Well, Scott? you know, J Judith I is paying a marvelous. queen this year, and so that's probably why Miss uh, Richfield was a little oh, biased. Darling, <laughs> thank you. But I think Judith Dance is just going to pull it off as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll be an exciting, an exciting uh, category, I think. But let's go. I want to move on to also the best actress, Kate Blanchett in Elizabeth. Fernanda Montenegro in Central Station, Gwyneth Paltrow, Shakespeare in Love, Meryl Streep, One True Thing, and Emily Watson, Hillary and Jackie. Scott, we'll start with you. I think that this is going to be an unusual year in that Kate, Kate is going to uh, be successful for Best Actress, and we're going to have both the Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress be women who portray Queen Elizabeth. I think they're both going to win this year. Okay, and Miss Richfield? I don't know. Uh, personally speaking, I'm kind of voting for, um, who's the gal that dated, uh, what's his name? Uh, ben Affleck. What was her name? Oh, that's uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. That's Gwyneth. Yeah. Okay, that's who I'm going to vote for. And you yes, I think she might pull it out. I, th I think she was just marvelous. And uh, Yosef in that film was, how do you pronounce that last name? Oh, that's, um, that's... Uh, 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 Ralph's brother. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I can't Rains, think of it. Isn't it? Fine. Fine. That's oh, fine. Yeah. And uh, so he was, that's quite a marvelous movie. And uh, so I'm voting for that. I think she might pull it out. Actor Robert Benini in Life is Beautiful, Tom Hanks, Saving Private Ryan, Ian McKellen, Gods and Monsters, Nick Nolte in Affliction, and Edward Norton in America History, American History 10. I think I'm going to have to go with. Um, I think I'll vote for, but it won't be Hanks. It will not be you Hanks. you have something against Tom? No, I think Tom's marvelous. Oh, I good. love Tom. Yeah, I do. And uh, a little wholesome for me. <laughs> you know, I like my men just a little seedier. But, uh, you know, I'm from Richfield. But uh, I think uh, I would go with, um, who's the gentleman? Um, not Ed Norton. Read the list again. Um, Ed Norton, Nick Nolte, no. Ian, Ian McKellen. Ian Mc I'm going to go with Ian. I like, that was an interesting movie. I didn't understand it, but it was an interesting movie. I, I think that, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Miss Richard and I apparently have similar tastes because ah. I think Ian McClellan's going to win, yeah. too. He's, he's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. He's a very accomplished stage actor, and I think the Academy likes that. Mm -hmm. uh, he probably isn't going to be making a lot more film, and uh, I thought it was a great character study. The Academy likes that, so I think, I think he has a great chance. Mm-hmm. 
Let's move on to, this is the biggie, best picture. Are you ready? Here they are. The nominees are Elizabeth, Life is Beautiful, Saving Private Ryan, Shakespeare in Love, and The Thin Red Line. I think <laughs> if the Oscars were held about six months ago, Saving Private Ryan would have won. Mm -hmm. However, I think the appeal for that film has crested, and I think most of Hollywood is talking about uh, Shakespeare in Love. And so I think that because they don't want to give the Best Director uh, Academy Award to Steven Spielberg, they're going to go with Shakespeare in Love, and uh, they're probably going to have quite a successful night. Mm-hmm. Ms. Richfield. And um, I think uh, I would have to agree. I think that's an excellent film, and uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> so uh, yes, I'm going to vote for two the votes. Same. I think for I Shakespeare, think Shakespeare in Love. In love. Wow. Yeah. Well, Let's we see. have it. There we have it. And Janet, what do you think? Oh, you know, Scott, <laughs> I, I'm I'm going to have to go with Shakespeare in Love. <laughs> Well, then I it's, don't, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's unanimous. It's, it is. What's the buzz around City Hall here? I haven't heard any buzz. What does Sharon Who? think? I don't know. We'll have to ask as soon as we get done. I, I should have asked before we got on because I think that's a, that's a very pertinent question. You're right on it. Well, maybe we'll have to buzz up there. <laughs> buzz up there and visit with Sharon and the, fr and the uh, friends at City Hall oh, here. You are talking about Sharon Sales Belton. Yes! Oh, the mayor Love her. of Minneapolis. She's Damn. fun. She is fun. She's great. You're fun. Oh, it's going to be no. a fun night. Thank tell you. me, Mr. Field. Tell me, what what are your plans for the evening? I mean, do well, you know what you're going to wear yet? Or I'm glad you asked that because mm -hmm. actually, um, I'm tickled that the Minnesota Opera, the, the Minnesota Opera, there we are. The <laughs> Minnesota Opera actually has asked me to uh, sing with one of their uh, guest artists, and so I'll be perhaps doing a little mm. number, a little musical number. I didn't know you and, sang uh, opera. Uh, well, you know, I uh, actually I don't. No, if I've ever been to an opera, actually, but uh, I did see a clip of Evita, and uh -huh. uh, I think I've got the gist. So uh, I Give might be uh, singing along, Give it a putting try. on the old breastplate and the horns, and getting out there. And see, that's it. That's worth it. Just right there to come to the event. Well, and it's that's be a lot of fun. That's why we actually was one of the reasons why we invited Miss Richfield in mm -hmm. 1981 because she is so versatile and flexible, mm -hmm. right. and she is just one of many live entertainers that are mm -hmm. going to be there that night. But the thing that I want to point out is that. There are a lot of people out there who don't want to miss a second of the Academy Awards. And so if they come to the event, they will see every second of it in the Orpheum Theater. And it's great because everybody claps together, laughs together, boos together. But mm -hmm. yet you can see every minute. And it is the closest thing to being there without actually attending the event. It is great fun. Event. I've been to many. And it's just really a treat to be sitting in Wonderful. a large audience feeling the energy and experiencing it. And what's great is that mm -hmm. if you get bored, you can go out and have complimentary desserts mm -hmm. from dozens of the Twin Cities' best restaurants. You can have complimentary beverages, compliments of Evian, Starbucks, Beef mm -hmm. Eater, and Corvassier. <laughs> and there's great silent auction uh -huh. items and lots of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. uh, not only is there the pre-Oscar party at Lewin and Bob's, but we've got a post-Oscar party at the Minneapolis Cafe, which is just a couple of blocks down the street, also on Hennepin Avenue. So. People can really do it up as big as they could in Hollywood with mm -hmm. pre-parties, post-parties, and the actual main event. And you have the D.L. Mayberry Awards that you're going to yes. announce, and that's a great thing. And you're raising money for some a very good cause. Right. Tickets are only $25 in advance, which is a great value for the evening. And 100% of those ticket prices benefit four local Minnesota AIDS organizations. Every Penny Counts, Park House, Minnesota AIDS Project, and Clare House. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great way to raise almost, uh, last year we raised just over a hundred thousand dollars for the four tremendous. charities. So yeah, wonderful, one little evening. Yeah, that is tremendous. Marvelous. If people want tickets, I want to give them the phone number. It is six one two. 989-5151, and that's Ticketmaster? You're right, and they can also pick up tickets at the State and Orpheum Theater box office or at Ideals, which is on the second floor of Calhoun Square. And Ms. Richfield, any final words of uh, wisdom here for our audience members or an invitation for them to come? Well, I would like to invite everyone personally to come down and enjoy the festivities. It's wonderful, and you can see, like Scott said, every bit of the program, so you won't be missing anything. But uh, uh, enjoy the wonderful crowd, the homosexuals, a lot of homosexuals. So uh, it's a fashionable crowd. Dress well and uh, pop on down and see us. It's a lot of fun. 
And it's been really fun having both of you with Thank us you. today. It's a great event, a worthy cause, and thanks very much for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. A spit field. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Coming up next, a clip from Misty Memories of the Girls' Junior High Bathroom, directed by Marjorie Tiemann and Arzu Gaksin. This is one of more than 60 films featured in this year's Women in the Director's Chair Film Festival, running March 5th through the 27th at the Walker Arts Center. For more information, call 612-375-7622. When I was in junior high in the early 70s, we used to set our hair in orange juice cans. And believe it or not, I slept in them. You know, you had to be very careful because sometimes the bobby pins would cause some pressure points. So, you know, you had to adjust it properly and then you'd find just the right can to balance your head on and sleep all night with a pile of orange juice cans attached to your head. We strove to achieve that Jean Shrimpton look. When I went to high school, it was 7th through 12th grade. And all the older girls used to go to the bathrooms, get to school at 6.30 in the a.m. to primp before going, so they looked perfect before they went, made their big debut test, Study Hall 200, where the meat line stood and everybody rated them as they walked by, all the boys. They'd uh, trade clothes, so they'd all plan like the day before what they were gonna borrow from the other, girl, from the other girls, and then they'd call them at night to remind them to bring them. So then they'd all be trading clothes first thing in the morning, and then a lot of times they'd have to shorten the dresses that they were wearing because their parents wouldn't let them out of, out of the house with the, their dresses so short. And then sometimes they'd get caught because the dresses were supposed to be, uh, the dresses were supposed to touch the ground when you were kneeling. So if you were in school and uh, they thought your dress was too short, you'd have to go to the principal's office and kneel on the floor to make sure your dress touched. And then if it didn't, You'd get sent home, or uh, you'd have to go in the bathroom and rip your hem down. Oh, the black mascara would be streaming down their faces and tears of humiliation at the thought of having to go around in school the rest of the day with their hem ripped down. The Women in the Director's Chair film series at The Walker includes a number of films by Minnesota-based women and a showcase of films by junior homegirls, teenagers in the Director's Chair. Again, call 612-375-7622 for more information. And now, the Artifacts Arts News with yours truly. And yours truly. Arts and academic achievement is the topic of an urban retreat for the arts announced recently. The Minneapolis Public Schools will host the event at North Community High School in the middle of June. The Minneapolis Public Schools Fine Art Department, collaborating with the Minnesota Center for Arts Education, the Minnesota Arts and Education Partnership, and Partners Arts and Schools for Students, expects participants to examine the big picture of arts and academic achievement over the course of a three-day event. Representatives from the Minnesota Film Board, the St. Paul Film Office, and the Minneapolis Office of Film, Video, and Recording were promoting the state film industry in Los Angeles at the Locations Expo Trade Show last month, and they'll return again this month to host the annual Ice Pack event that brings former Minnesotans now working in the film industry in Los Angeles together for an evening of making connections and contacts. Governor Jesse Ventura is expected to attend. The Nancy Hauser Dance Company in school announced plans for its sixth annual Children's Cross-Cultural Dance Camp. Scheduled for this August, the 15-day trip to Ibarakishi, Japan, features creative dance, art, and traditional Japanese music instruction, along with an informal performance. The Minneapolis-based company invites young people between the ages of 6 and 18 years of age to participate. Last year, Minneapolis hosted 22 Japanese children and their parents from the sister city of Ibarakishi. Minnesota's commercial production industry sales tax bill is now a part of the governor's budget and members of the industry continue to garner bipartisan support for this initiative that would alleviate the 6.5% sales tax on the creative services that go into the making of a television commercial. 
Millions of U.S. travelers extend their trips for cultural activities. Results from the 1998 National Travel Survey, conducted by the Travel Industry Association of America, produced some interesting data. 26.7 million adults added time to their trips because of these cultural opportunities. Of those, 30% added one night, 5% added two extra nights, and 4% added three or more nights to their trips. And that's the Artifacts Arts News for March 1999. Arts medicine is the next topic of discussion as Phil welcomes Dr. Janine Spear and Janet Horvath right after this art quote. And welcome back. Our, our next conversation is one that I've wanted to have for quite a while, actually. We have thousands of practitioners of arts, uh, different disciplines here in the Twin Cities. And one of the things that people encounter is health issues around performing and, and doing visual arts. And I'm very pleased to have as two guests, two pioneers in the field of arts medicine. Janet Horvath, thank you for being here. Thank you. Associate yes. Principal Cellist with the Minnesota Orchestra. That's right. And Dr. Janine Spear, Hi. nice to meet you and have you here. Thank you both. Um, for the sake of folks who are sitting back at home and thinking, well, the arts, what, what can possibly you know, cause acute uh, uh, problems in that or chronic uh, ailments in that? Could we just define a little bit what, what it is you two care about? Let's start with you, Janet, and talk about medical terms in a moment. Okay. I'm sure that a lot of your viewers will say, well, how can it hurt to play? And even the, the terminology of play implies that it's all fun and games and it's so glamorous what you do on the stage in your long gown. But what people don't often see is the actual physicality of playing an instrument. There's a lot of repetition. There are a lot of awkward postures. And sometimes over a career, these things are cumulative. And you can have injuries just from the re repetition. And, and, and long and hours. Well, and speaking of, of career, too, I think people think, well, you go to the orchestra and you know it's an hour and a half. But of course, they're not only the hours of rehearsal that go into that performance. Exactly. But as you were saying earlier, decades of a person's life go into preparing for that particular performance. Well, many of us are already very accomplished musicians at age 12, 15, 17, and then we play many, many, many years, way longer than many careers. Um, for example, we have someone retiring now after 49 years in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So it's not 30 years and then you're out. Right. Um, and we're so into this whole thing about playing our instrument is so much a part of ourselves that when an injury does occur, it's devastating because it's your identity. Right, as well as your livelihood. Definitely your livelihood, too. Dr. Spear, um, you work over at the Sister Kenny Institute. Now, and, and for you, this is a specialty? Yes. Can you describe a little bit about what you encounter on a regular basis? Well, I see, I see a lot of students as well as professional musicians. and so. The habits start early, uh, of too much, too soon sometimes, uh, and too often. Uh, for example, playing for several hours. I just recently talked to someone who's just become a professional, and she's having a great deal of trouble letting go of the long hours that she practices as a student. She doesn't feel confident enough yet. Okay. She can in intellectualize that, but she can't make herself do it. It's very hard to even cut back. But we do see these same problems very young. Okay, of and people playing a long time, awkward postures, their bodies may physically not be ready for it, and they usually present as pain. Sometimes they present as numbness or tingling, and sometimes they present as a loss of control of playing the instrument. Oh, really? Okay, so that the body is actually reacting against whatever the condition the is. The coordination is impaired. And they're having a harder time fingering a bow or whatever. But the, the real problem that we've encountered in music medicine, and it's getting a lot better, is that we are artists and we don't have the attitude of being athletes that other athletes do and they understand their bodies better than we do. They know about warming up, they know about cooling down, they understand the mechanics of pacing themselves, sometimes over a whole career. They have a whole team of people that are there supporting them, therapists and um, and doctors you know, on the sidelines in case they, exactly, they twist the knee. Exactly, masseuses. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, we're only beginning to look at playing instruments in that light of, hey, you know, you've got to warm up. Your body is going to be taxed to its limit 
Um, sometimes we play Mahler symphonies that last two hours without any break. And, you know, you're afraid to even blink, you know, during the performance. Well, the concentration is so focused. Exactly. Yeah. And physically, it's so focused, too. Where, you know, you, I, I sometimes talk about um, my favorite example is The Messiah. Great music, fun to play, three hours long. And it's the, one of the most taxing things that any of us can play. Now, why is that? Well, there's one movement that I actually counted how many times I move my arm this way. There were 900 bars, I mean, 90 bars, I'm sorry, 90 bars and eight <laughs> notes. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, but there are pieces of 900 bars. There are 90 bars in this one two-minute movement. And within the movement, I play, my arm goes eight times back and forth. Yeah. So how many times is that in, in one each bar. In, in each bar eight times mm -hmm. over 90 bars that's only in a 2 minute movement. That's a great and, example. And when I tell people that in my stand partner I said, "Hey, you know, we do 720, it says 720 of these in just this moment." She says, "Oh, I don't want to know that." Amazing. You know, and um, well, doctor, you were nice enough to actually bring us uh, an arm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you show us a little bit? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, where some of these problems manifest themselves, or what happens to uh, the human body? Well, I think one of the points Janet made is that these are tremendous repetitious movements, and some of these muscles are small muscles. They're really not designed for this uh, intensity over a long period of time. Also. Uh, the muscles need to relax, they need to stretch, they need that, those waste products to go away. So people will get pain sometimes in the muscle bellies. These are the muscles that bring the wrist up and the fingers up. Very important for speed and accuracy, especially speed, lifting your finger off the string, off the key. Sometimes people will get pain and tension over the tendons themselves or the small muscles of the hand. So they may get pain in the back of the hand, the wrist. Sometimes they get tension, just like tennis elbow, uh, an inflammation where the muscle attaches to the bone. So these are probably the most common things, which is a repetitious strain injury. Uh, it's under the term of tendonitis because the tendons also get inflamed. Carpal tunnel itself is rare, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's a secondary effect of inflammation of the flexor tendons of the wrist and fingers. Okay. And then the other thing we should briefly mention is that when people play instruments, they're very often in this sort of posture. A cello, a case in yeah. point, probably. Right. Or this, which yeah. mm -hmm. I can challenge anyone to try to do this for even a minute. Yeah. It's very awkward to I hold I think a violin. besides violinists, it would be a bullfighter is about the only other person that ever does that. <laughs> but not for that long. <laughs> no, no, it's just an instant. They're not the symphony. You were going to make a point, though. I'm sorry. Well, but the basic point is that uh, muscles shorten and tighten yeah. in certain positions. And so you have to stretch them back out so they can function effectively. The other opposite problem is that many musicians are what we call hypermobile. Uh, maybe that contributes to some of their flexibility and the ease of playing and the speed with which they've been able to progress with their instrument. But they actually have more problems because they have to overuse their muscles to stabilize their joints. Mm -hmm. And so it's not unusual for me to come and see someone whose elbow hyperextends or their thumbs or their fingers, some of the joints may collapse as they press strings or keys. So those patients, we often will give them a strengthening program once the inflammation subsides. And I'm going to bet until it starts to hurt, they think, oh, isn't this great? I'm so flexible, I'm so fast. And if they stop for a day and it doesn't hurt, then they jump back into their eight hours of playing, and that's the other problem. Well, I mentioned earlier that you two have been sort of pioneers in this. Mm -hmm. There's a little story about how you first got involved in, in a conference that you put on. Can you talk a little bit about that, Janet? Well, going back, when I was a student, I did sustain a serious tendonitis kind of injury, and it hurt so badly, but I ignored it. I thought, well, you've got to play through the pain, just as um, a lot of athletes think that you're getting better if it hurts and you just have to work through it. So I got to the point that I couldn't even use a knife and fork wow. or hold up a phone or turn a doorknob. And at the time, I, tur I went to at least a dozen different kinds of doctors, and a lot of people said, well, how can it hurt to play? Or this must all be in your head. You're such sensitive people, you musicians. Or that I have to change my career, which is not what I wanted so to do. So you hear. ended up having to kind of recast so I, your, yes, I, exactly. your behavior. Yes, exactly. I started over trying to eliminate tension in my playing, understand how to warm up and cool down and pace myself, and 
and use my body to its maximum. And Can we jump ahead a little bit? Because at a certain point in your professional career, then you put a conference together yes, to so help alert people when to I, these issues? When I became uh, associate principal cello here and uh, started looking around, so many of my colleagues were hurting. And in fact, at the time that I started um, dreaming about this, there were half a dozen people out in the orchestra on two or three month leaves because of pain. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, surely we can get some doctors in here to just talk to us about anatomy and understanding how to, how to use our bodies better. Is this where you two met? That's correct. Yes, okay. it just kind of snowballed, in fact. There was so much interest. I went to the U, the University of Minnesota, and they have a professional development and conference services, and they helped us put together a na national conference, which was actually the first time that doctors and musicians and famous teachers came together and talked about these issues. And the name of this conference? Playing Less Hurt. And it's well, the first one was Playing, playing Hurt. hurt. Okay. We decided yeah. playing less hurt. that we were yeah. trying to imply that people were going to get better. Uh, it was also, I think, one of the first conferences, and there's now been three of them, uh, where musicians played as prominent a role. I've been to mm. conferences where largely physicians speak. And although many physicians are musicians, I think sometimes if you do something, it gives you some insight, but you can maybe see it a bit more narrowly. And it was, it's really exciting to see musicians and physicians and therapists in the same room talking to each other. That's right. Now, we're just out of time, but if people want to get in touch with Sister Kenny Institute, there's a phone number? 863-4495 with the area code 612. That's right, we We've have to, say, to, learn that to say that now. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, thank you for being here. Thank you. Ms. Chellis, thank you for being Thanks here. Janet Horvath, yes. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now, Minneapolis attorney and literary agent Barbara Gislason will join me right after this fascinating look at the lifting, the actual lifting of the Schubert Theater. Stay tuned.
Well, now that video of the Schubert was produced and directed by Paul Augustin of Location Images for the MCDA. And I think a number of us that saw it rather enjoyed that. A little documentary with a little push there. My next guest is uh, an attorney and a literary agent, Barbara Gisselson. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I guess because I've been reading a lot, I know a lot of writers and authors, I'm familiar with the fact that it's hard to get ahead in the, in the field after you've written the thing, put it in your drawer, and then you say, I'd like somebody to read this. That's where you come in. What, what does a literary agent do once you've connected with an author, a writer? The first thing that we do is we ask somebody to send us a partial. And what that means they're, is they're going to send us a cover letter and the first three chapters of their work. I want to tell people that we get rid of most of the partials in the first page. You just, just that quick. You can that tell fast. right there. That fast. And so people think, well, it's kind of slow at the beginning, but it picks up later. The people who are doing the cut aren't going to read that far. Right. Th their, their job is to go through this much material as fast as they possibly can so that they're spending more time doing the cut on the stuff that looks promising. So if it starts out something like it was a dark and stormy night, I mean, it's already starting to go over into the left side of the pile there, right? That's right. Wow. A lot of times you can tell with the first sentence. And one of the things that I frequently do at a writer's conference is I literally open up partials from other states and read the first paragraph. And I ask people to vote on whether they want me to read any further. And usually <laughs> it's very clear to the audience I was gonna say, what's why the we can tell. Do they, do they, does the They're shock like, of recognition? Yeah, the shock of recognition is like, this is obvious. <laughs> right, but I'll bet they've never maybe individually thought of the fact that, yeah, there's going to be somebody sitting at a desk with a stack like this and has right. to go through volume after volume of this stuff. Well, let's say they make the cut. Right. And, and it's looking interesting and it's holding a reader's attention. Then what might happen? At, at my agency, it'll go to an editor who specializes in the subject matter, like a mystery editor, a science fiction and fantasy editor, a romance editor, and I'm branching out now into some alternative medicine. Okay. But it'll be a specialist reading it. And often, the, if the editor thinks the person is great, but the work has some flaws, the editor will write the person directly and say, we'll look at it again after a rewrite. Now, if I'm a writer, though, that's great news. I mean, that's basically saying, hey, there's potential here. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that wouldn't, that's not a bad thing. It, you know, especially for unpublished authors. Right, yeah, first time out. No, yeah. I mean, if you're Quite frankly, with published authors, we sometimes write the same letter. Well, I can imagine, <laughs> sure. Okay, well, let's keep taking this, tracking this out a little bit further. You've worked with a, a writer, and it's looking better and better. How do you and your agency, how do you determine that it might be ready to take out, I suppose, what, to New York? Maybe I'm stereotyping here, but it goes to, you then need to get it in front of a publisher? Right. I think agencies differ in what they're looking for. I'm looking for what I'd call high-end writing. Uh, I'm, not I'm, I'm also an attorney, so I don't have to make my living just taking whatever comes in. So I've got a real high standard for what I'll accept. M some agencies have a standard which w would be more of a, a just a, a, a commercial standard. They don't have to believe in the work that much. If they think it has commercial potential, they'll take it. I won't. Well, to use the phrase, I mean, you're looking for literature? Well, I would say that, that there's two kinds of things that I like the best. One is more of a blend between literary fiction and the genre. Like, like a Deborah Woodworth is one of my clients. If you, if you look at her uh, Shaker Mystery series, the woman is just an outstanding writer. She's a sociology, uh, sociology PhD. And it's just a neat, it's just well written and, and just impressive. Um, the editor I first sold her to went from Avon to Berkeley and he said he's never gotten a better author. Oh, excellent. And I, I, I like to be bringing in people at that level. Right. I, I also, you know, in, in a completely different vein, like people who are wildly creative. <laughs> And they don't have to be so literary, then. They can just be wildly creative. Okay, I now, like that, uh, too. any particular genre that, where that creeps up more in the fantasy arena yeah. or whatever? Yeah. Are, are, you mentioned one name. Are there others that we might recognize that we can pick up at our local bookstore? Oh, gosh. Um, or a ton, maybe, and you don't yeah, want to go single out anybody. But you represent, well, how, how many folks can you represent at a time? I mean, is, are we talking I, dozens? I represent or? as many as I want to. Okay, again, because you don't need to necessarily make your living just doing this, because you right. deal with heartbreak. I mean, you're also right. like. <laughs> You're, you're dealing with family law and stuff like that too, right? I, I do uh, family law and I do art and entertainment law. Okay. And my literary agency grew out of my art and entertainment law practice. Let's talk about the By demand. I mean, somebody came to my office and demanded. There's one really outstanding literary agency in town. They were getting far too much material, and so people just couldn't get through. So I kept getting calls as an art and entertainment lawyer demanding other referrals. Oh. Well, one day somebody came in my office and said, why can't you do it? So it's market demand is what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, right. So, the first thing I tried to do was I got him an option with ABC Capital Cities, and the next day I called the Oprah Winfrey people on another project, and they spent an hour on the phone with me. I thought, 
I can get this. I can do this. This sounds I good, have, though. Yeah, I have sales personality. You're some home runs here right yeah. off the bat. There. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. It was encouraging. Well, let's step back then for a moment uh, in terms of the entertainment law. What, what the heck does that mean? It, it's... Like there's a bad well, sitcom, you, know, you there, got to sue somebody there, or? There are like completely two different veins of art and entertainment law, and it was really, it took me a while, it's kind of like a secret. When I, <laughs> well, you can when, tell me. When I went out to Los Angeles, I met one of the big art and entertainment lawyers, and he did music for, for independent feature films and other movies, and I thought, okay, you're an art and entertainment lawyer, so what do you do? They represented clients who made movies with their DWIs, their divorces, their Oh, wills. so they had very little to do with the arts. We're talking the <laughs> yeah. artist and his life. Yeah, they had art and entertainment clients oh, and serviced okay. them. So one of the hilarious things in town is a lot of people say they were Prince's lawyer, like for a quick claim deed. Oh, okay. <laughs> they don't say but that. Now, it had it nothing to do the with the arts. property here of that's the right. artist. Okay. But so I mean, that's right. But that's a joke to art and entertainment lawyers when right. people say they represented Prince, yeah. and it wasn't for the arts. Okay, all right. So that's okay. one vein, though, you're talking right. about. Right. And the other vein is they really are representing him in the arts. Right. Like right now, I'm representing somebody who's, there's a great big inter, uh, infomercial coming out. It's an educational product. She's like just a brilliant woman uh, educator. And so there's all these negotiations with regard to the rights of, you know, her as the expert and the people who are developing the product and, and you know, and all, you know li all these licenses and sub-licenses and... I know in Hollywood there's, there's kind of constant battles between agents and managers. Do you have to deal with that here or is that mostly a, a Tinseltown kind of problem where they're, they're constantly battling for power and prestige and um, who gets to make a career happen and who doesn't and who gets the front end and the back end of the deals and stuff? I've, I have never heard it come up at a bar association meeting in Minnesota okay. in art and entertainment, and, and, and nor through any way art and entertainment at Lawyer France, in okay. terms of their their own practice. So this is a Pacific Coast situation. Well, when we, you know, in, in about five years, I expect we'll have that problem. When we, okay. We're, we're getting better, bigger and bigger and better and better here. Yeah. In fact, um, I was the first chair ever of the art and entertainment law section of the Minnesota State Bar Association, and one of the things that I really pushed was if we didn't cross train each other with what we knew, we would lose the business to the east and the west coast. I really tried to set the climate Right. That we, you know, the, those of us who are better at music law would train the ones who are better at, at the book arts, you know, better at the performing arts. Sure. So I think that the attorneys in Minnesota have been really good stewards of that obligation, and, and so we're getting that business. So as the people get hotter and hotter here, we're able to hold on to them. Let's talk about the other side, the talent pool. Um, obviously, it sounds like this is a, more of a mission of love and enjoyment on your part in terms of representing literary authors. Um, it's, a, it's more of a calling. Uh, more of a calling. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have enough of a talent pool that... Um, and I, I think I know the answer from what you said earlier, but are, are you getting people coming in the door or sending things in the mail? I mean, do we have a lot of good writers that you're excited to see? We have such a group. I'm, romance writers in Minnesota are unbelievable. The mystery writers in Minnesota are unbelievable, and so are the science fiction and fantasy writers. I mean, we're known throughout the country of having really outstanding people in those areas. And then I get submissions from all over the country and Canada and Israel. And you, okay, you know, so I the guest list in the agency is a national concern. I'm in seven books in the bookstore. Wow. And in the library. With seven books? Yeah, like Literary Reference. Marketplace, oh, Writer's Digest, Pink Pages. You yeah. know. Well, let's talk about a couple of the, of the issues that are out there in terms of copyright. I mean, it seems to me things are changing in terms of copyright law. And uh, Do you encounter that? I mean, are people, is there this leakage of, of intellectual property? And do you have to defend your clients that something they did, maybe they wrote it here in Minnesota, is getting pirated or they're not? Or is it more a matter of them not getting the best deal they could get from a publisher. I mean, what do you, what's, what's the hard work you do on behalf of a writer? This doesn't exactly answer your question, but it, as a literary agent, I make people sign a contract with me. One of the things I have in the contract is all this financial responsibility for them if there's a copyright infringement in their book. Because if they're going to start to argue with me about a copyright infringement with a contract with me, I know I'm going to have trouble when it gets to a publisher. So I want to really bring home to people at that stage that they better make sure things are right. Oh, I could talk about copyright forever. <laughs> I'm not even sure where to begin. Yeah, it's uh, a big issue, though. I mean, people are up against it all the time. Well, I mean, as an art and entertainment lawyer, I mean, somebody would come in with a product, and I, they, they'd say, well, am I going to get into trouble for copyright infringement? I'd say, just a minute. And I'd put the things down side by side, and I'd call in my secretary. Or, or a paralegal or whoever was around. And they'd say, does it look to you like one copied the other? And they go, well, yes. And that's and I'd say, well, why? And they'd tell me, well, this looks like this. So I'd say to the person, you've got a copyright infringement problem. It's that easy to identify. 
Because in a sense, your staff person is a surrogate uh, juror. That's I right. I mean, if somebody was just an average citizen said, yeah, that looks like the same language right, right there. So right there. I mean, yeah. the first person you call in says, yeah, it looks like they cut. Now, it's, the standard's a little harder. Did they have access to the material? Did they yeah. copy it? People could simultaneously create the same product in Florida and California and never have met each other with no communication and on the Internet. sometimes. Yeah, with no, in the jingles and soap, you know, the yeah. soaps, um, the soap commercials. Oh, right, right. So yeah, you, c you can have the same thing. But if something is published like in a national publication, there's, there's accept, it's expected that there was access. If it's set in your drawer and the same thing shows up in Florida, you know, it's not expected that there's copyright infringement. How would they have it? Yeah, just coincidence. Right. We've just got a couple moments left. Um, your background, how did you get into Obviously, with the literary stuff, someone came in and demanded it. But did you know you wanted to go into this uh, whole general field, entertainment law? or? I, I won a state essay contest for 7th and 8th graders in the 7th grade. As a writer. As a writer. As a writer. So you, you had this writing interest. Yeah. OK. And I, it, it kept. It was a it, long way from there to law school, though. And, and Harriet Sheridan, the dean at Carleton College, where I went, the senior said, why didn't we get you before? You have all this talent. It was like, darn, it's too late. And then when I was a young lawyer, I started an article about the Lazare Agency. I thought, God, that's, that's the, such a neat job. Is that the big I one said, you were talking yeah. about? Yeah. I said, darn, it's too yeah. late. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how you think things are too late. But it didn't, it didn't stop you. You kept no. going into that field. In, in fact, part of what I do as a literary agent is I write pitch letters. And they have to be compelling. So I'm, I'm writing. So you bring in that. I'm uh, writing pitch yeah. letters. Yeah. All right. And they're good. Got any books in the drawer uh, under your name? No. Not yet? No. All right. Barbara Gisselson, thank you. Thank you. Little overview of literary agency. Thanks. Now, next up, we're going to have a video essay on the month of March in Minnesota. It's written and produced by Rebecca Bryden and several of her colleagues over at the Minneapolis Community and Technical College. Rebecca also has served as assistant to Janet, my co-host, in the Minneapolis Office of Film, Video, and Recording for the past year. She's now moving on to new career heights. And we say thanks, Rebecca, for your help with artifacts. Now, here's a familiar scene from Minnesota March. December, January, and February bring snow emergencies, but March has the ultimate weapon. battering and bruising us into the local car alignment shop. Well, you won't do right to save your doggone soul. Yeah, no, no. Well, for this month's performance segment, Jamie Whitner singing Please Don't Go. Now when I 
I get caught up and who but when I get caught up and who but when I get caught up in who I let you go thinking about you each day I feel your love makes my head spin round and round in the day Beautiful sound. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. That's good. <laughs> You've been sick. singing a while, huh? Yeah, for a while. All right. Now, mm -hmm. you're you're kicking off a concert series down at Central City Theater. Ah, uh, yes, I am. Now, what's, what's that all about, and when's that happen? Um, well, the Central City Theater is um, Phyllis, it's managed by Phyllis Productions. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm working with a lady, Judy Cooper Lyle. Yep. And we're having a show like the first three weeks of March. Okay. And so. Um, and you're kicking it off. Right. I'm, I'm starting out this spring, first weekend in March. Okay. Right. And it's a variety of different kinds of music, as uh, I understand it. Yeah. Uh, so, R&B, gospel, jazz. Sounds like a lot of fun. Okay. Well, I want you to check out uh, Jamie and the other uh, performers over at the Central City Theater throughout the first three weeks in March. Janet will be back to wrap up the show with me in just a moment. We're going to take another quick look at uh, some images from Minnesota March. All right. Spring officially arrives in March, but not in Minnesota. We Minnesotans take pride in surviving winter, but March holds a terror all its own. It teases and tortures us as it vacillates between tantalizing hints of spring and the long, drawn-out demise of winter. It's a balancing act between hope and angst. In winter, the only thing in spring water is a can of tuna. But by March, everything is in spring water, or more precisely, winter water. And if not in water, then ice. Again, that was Minnesota March from my assistant, Rebecca Bryden. Thanks, Rebecca, for all you've done for this past year, boys. Yeah, you've really helped make you. it happen. Absolutely. That's really nice. Yeah. A um, couple of chit-chat yep. items here. Uh, some of you may not know that uh, the University Gospel Choir over at the University of Minnesota, under the direction of Sanford Moore, they'll be having a concert uh, Sunday, March 7th. 
at 4 p.m. over at Ferguson Hall. That's so, right. Sounds and like some good tunes there. Our uh, venerable, wonderful, fun guest, Miss Richfield, <laughs> yes. does have an appearance coming up, and I did want to let you know she will be with the Gay Men's Chorus Concert April 9th and 10th at the Ted Mann Concert Hall at the U of M. That's Miss Richfield. Don't miss that. It's going to be right. A you miss her, thing. she'll come find you. I think. I, <laughs> I mean, think that's she's way dynamic. Works. That's right. Yeah. You know, this is kind of a university theme here. Mm -hmm. uh, for 30 years, Arthur Ballot taught introductory theater courses at the University of Minnesota. They're legion. They're famous. He's now retired. I think he lives out in the West Coast. The Minnesota Association of Community Theaters is bringing him back, not to town. They're going to be up in Hibbing for their uh, uh, theater festival. They do this, I think, every couple years. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's going to be doing a, a, a speaking up there on a topic. Uh, he happens to be a Hibbing native, and I just thought for folks who've ever taken his course, they might want to know that Arthur Ballot's coming through town, middle of, uh, I guess, March 11th through the 14th. Absolutely. Um, and I think next up, our events calendar. That's right. So get your papers and pencils and note down a few things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And if you have any suggestions or questions about what you saw on Artifacts, be sure to call us at... Our hotline, 673-2234. <laughs> and don't forget... The fabulous giveaway. That's right. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'm Janet Sun. And I'm Phil Lindsay. We'll see you next month.